Let me skip a bit. It might be taken from the kings without imperiling religion. Because uh, we can take their political power and the Greeks, that's, that's the essence of the revolution, I guess, is that they broke with the idea that politics was ordained by God. They started saying lots of stuff's ordained by God, but politics we will now decide on. Uh, this was an increasing secularization of the mind. Lucretius was right in saying that Greek thinkers were the death knell to religion. Royalty was therefore preserved, but shorn of its power. It was no longer anything but a priesthood. Aristotle says, quote, In very ancient times, kings had absolute power in peace and in war. But in the course of time, some renounced this power voluntarily. From others, it was taken by force, and nothing was left to these kings but the care of the sacrifices, end quote. Plutarch gives a similar account, quote, As the kings displayed pride and rigor in their commands, the greater part of the Greeks took away their power and left them only the care of religion. He gives a further example from Herodotus, but we'll skip that. This royalty, thus reduced to a priesthood, continued, in most cases, to be hereditary in the sacred family that had long before established the hearth and commenced the national worship. In the time of the Roman Empire, that is to say seven or eight centuries after this revolution, there were yet at Ephesus, at Marseille, and at Thespia, families who preserved the title and insignia of ancient royalty, and who still presided over religious ceremonies. In the other cities, the sacred families were extinct, and the kingly office had become elective and generally annual. So that's a bit more about uh, the revolutions. So at this point, we are going to go to science, the nature of engineering in the ancient world and their knowledge about that. We'll look at just a few names in engineering. Then we will be going to Greek Science in Antiquity by Marshall Claggett. Hey, engineering in the ancient world, J.G. Landles. And now we're going to go all the way to page uh, 186, chapter 8, skipping uh, the vast majority of the book because we don't want to spoil this book for the ancient uh, engineering series. What I'm trying to give here is a, a picture of the accomplishments of science and engineering in Greece from the time of about 600 up to the time of about 200. So this is going to be our first glimpse into the Golden Age of Greece. We're getting closer and closer, and here we're going to start looking at a bit of the Golden Age of Greece again in scientific thought. And we're on uh, chapter 8 called The Progress of Theoretical Knowledge. It was published in 1978, by the way. Since the Roman contribution to technology, though considerable, was almost entirely in the field of practical application, the state of Greek theoretical knowledge may be regarded, for all intents and purposes, as that of the whole Mediterranean world and the Roman Empire down to the 5th century AD or even later. It will suffice to highlight one characteristic feature of Greek thought. It is possible to see in almost every branch of Greek literature a particular trait of the Greek mind which had important effects in some branches of scientific thought. It was a liking for stability, rest, and permanence, a corresponding dislike, almost mistrust, of change and movement and what they called genesis and phthora, P-H-T-H-O-R-A, coming to be and passing away. Why this should be is something of a mystery but perhaps their very acute awareness of the impermanence of physical things in their world and human life itself caused them to set a high value on the permanent and the stable. Now, if that's the case, why didn't other cultures value the permanent and the stable? Because other cultures were supposedly aware of the impermanence of physical things, whatever. I mean, at some point you have to just say somebody had a thought someone thought a thought. You know, you just can't get past it. At some point you have to point out a thought was thought. 
for before that not was thought. However, that may be one result was that their understanding of static conditions, example given hydrostatics or mechanical problems not involving movement, was very acute, whereas their ideas on dynamics and ballistics were surprisingly incomplete and inaccurate. Very true. Now, it took millennia to get uh, back to an understanding that the Greeks had of static situations. It took Newton to figure out uh, dynamic situations, to, to begin, to start beginning to understand dynamic situations. But let us continue. They spoke of velocities, relative velocities, and resistance, but they hardly even began to study acceleration or deceleration. They had only a rather vague notion of inertia or kinetic energy. They observed that a stone continued to fly through the air after it had left the hand of the thrower, but throughout antiquity they continued to offer some quite absurd explanations of why it should do so. The force continues to impel it after it leaves the hand because the air is rushing out of the way and pulling it forward, was one of the explanations. Strange. When the Greek philosophers first began to inquire into the physical nature of the universe, it was precisely the problem of change and of coming to be and passing away that preoccupied them, and perhaps disturbed them. More than a century later, Plato was still bothered by the same problems, and though his thought was untypical in several important respects, on this point it accorded completely with the Greek tradition. He went so far as to say that physical objects, because they undergo perpetual movement, change, and destruction, cannot be known or understood in the true sense of those terms. And one of the aims of his famous theory was to supply in the forms or ideas eternal and unchanging objects of true knowledge by relation to which material things could be studied and reasonably interpreted, though never truly known. So get that, through the relation to which material things could be studied and reasonably interpreted. So there is a reality, it's there, it's just swimming chaos of contradictoriness, and you have to get in there somehow and figure out what's going on. And Plato's world of forms was a way to address this worry about what is the nature of change and where is permanence. One consequence was what might be termed an anti-physical trend in Plato. Though his Timaeus, devoted to a detailed, if rather curious, analysis of the physical world and its creation, he elsewhere exhorts the true philosopher to turn his back on such matters, rise above them in the pursuit of true wisdom and knowledge. Now, the, the nature of Plato's anti-physical ideas is, is because if, if all of nature and reality, and I mean, he says anti-physical, how about anti-reality? Because there isn't anything else besides the hustle-bustle of facts. Uh, nothing else exists. So to say that all of this is a front for some other thing which does not actually exist isn't anti-physical, it's anti-real. That's, that's fine. Uh, Plato's admirers see this as the honest logical conclusion from his theory of forms and his epistemology, that you should turn your back on the physical reality and just think with rational, you know, be a philosopher. His enemies see it as the snobbish contempt of an aristocrat and a man of independent means for those of his fellows who had to deal with physical objects all their lives and worked for their living. So some people read his scorn of the physical world as just his aristocratic Marxist, his mind was warped by his class standing. This feature of Plato's thought would be less important were it not for the fact that some of his followers in later centuries not only accepted the anti-physical attitude, but carried it even further than Plato had thought fit. That's true, after Plato left the scene, the subsequent thinkers stripped away the Greek aspects of it. Uncritically, and without really understanding Plato's arguments, they exalted the pure and the theoretical sciences, such as geometry and astronomy, 
and they looked down 